It's been called nice, fantastics, a very nice lecture, and a bit basic if you'll pardon the pun. Yes, I will always pardon the pun on HTM School. Hello and welcome to episode 10 of HTM School, where we talk about topology. Now, depending on who you're talking to, topology could mean different things. We're going to look at it from a neuron standpoint. Some neurons in the cortex are closer than others. A neuron is physically weighted to connect more often and more strongly to those close neurons. Lateral inhibitory connections create local groupings of cells that affect each other's activity. One aspect of neuronal topology is the grouping of neurons together locally. How this locality is implemented today in NUPIC is a Euclidean distance calculation between bit locations in different representations. NUPIC is the Numenta platform for intelligent computing, which is the HTM system that I've been running all these visualizations on that we've seen throughout these episodes. So let's take a look at some two-dimensional inputs and how it's represented into the input space and also how the spatial pooler maps itself onto that two-dimensional input space when it has a topology applied as well. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce a new visualization. Um, so let me start with the input space. So what I've got here is the input space to the spatial pooler. I think this is like a 32-bit by 32-bit animated GIF that I have split up into its frames and encoded every pixel as an on or off bit. So you can see the shape of a man dancing back and forth in this input space. Um, so this input is topological. There's a very obvious spatial relationship. We basically have a moving image in this input space, which is different from the type of data that I've shown you in all these other episodes of HTM School. This is why we might wanna try and enable topology. If we have an input space with a rich uh, topological uh, structure to it. So in this case, it's not necessarily rich, but there's definitely a topological structure to this data. Um, so another thing about this animation that you might have known or might have noticed is that it is three-dimensional. Uh, so there is the spatial pooler, and here is the, the input space. Now I'm going to zoom way out here. Let's move them a little bit closer to each other so that we can do comparisons. There we go. So what we've got here, if I can get them both in the viewport, is the input space on the left, the green bits are the on bits, and the, the rest are all off. And on the right, we have the spatial pooler. The spatial pooler over here on the right is a, a three-dimensional structure because it's got columns and cells per column. So the spatial pooler is, is constructed two-dimensionally and it also has four cells per column. Uh, so that's what we're, we're looking at here. Um, each one of these yellow bits is uh, an active bit for this time step. Let me turn this off and you can see very clearly as I go next, 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 those active bits are changing. And one thing you'll notice right away is they're sort of swaying back and forth with the input. So this is different. This doesn't usually happen. Uh, so let me show you what this looks like without topology for a moment. So I just basically turned all the topological elements of the spatial pooler off and reinstantiated it. And this is what those active columns look like with no topology. They're scattered all over the input space, which makes sense if you go back and view all of our other episodes on the spatial pooler. That's what the spatial pooler does by default. Um, so I'm gonna show you why topology has this spatial characteristics or spatial grouping of activity based on what's in the input space's uh, topological structure. Um, and, and let me, explain two different reasons or two ways that topology is implemented um, in, in HTM and in, in NUPIC specifically. So first of all, um, so I just mentioned this is topological input, but we're not processing it topologically. So if I show, if I click a column, for example, in which I just click this red column here in the input space, um, every column I click has a different set of potential pools. That's what these orange bits are, and they're sort of um, overlaid also on top of the input. So you can see there's a green orange, an orange, and a green. And every time I go to a different column, we have a different set of potential pools. I explained this in previous episodes about the spatial pooler. Um, so a difference, if I turn topology on, and let me just move to an input, there we go. So with uh, 
a very, very obvious change here. With topology on, as I click different columns in the spatial pooler, they all have a completely different viewport or receptive field uh, of the input space. So they don't all see everything. Whereas in global inhibition with no topology, um, every column sees all of the input space and can work with all of the input space. That's why we get all of those active bits spread throughout all the columns in the spatial pooler, because every column has an opportunity to react to every cell within its potential pool, which is expanded across the entire input space. With topology on, um, each column only has a window into the input. So that's one aspect of topology. Um, the other aspect is column neighborhoods. So let me go back with no topology. Again, I'm gonna select a column and I'm gonna show the column's neighborhood. So what this really means is there's, there's a column competition to find out which columns are the winning columns which each time step. Um, this competition or this inhibition to determine these winning columns is global throughout the entire spatial pooler when there's no topology enabled. However, if I turn topology on, you'll see that now each column's neighborhood is no longer global. So that competition or that the inhibition to determine which columns are winning is now restricted to local areas of the input space, which applies a topology to the spatial pooler itself and its columns relationships with other columns. So in addition to the, each column's projection to the input space being limited to a regional local section of the input space, the spatial pooler columns themselves, the actual column competition is affected by the locality of each column in the spatial pooler. And as you can, as you can see, we can go through here and see specifically uh, each column's topological nature. This column projects this input, in, and these are its columns in its neighborhood that affect uh, its competition with all the rest of the columns in the space. Uh, some other interesting things that I like to point out here are the active duty cycles. Um, so let's turn topology off again. Let's start running. And you'll see, again, these are scattered throughout the space. There's no topology. If I turn the active duty cycles display on, if you remember from a previous episode about boosting, Active duty cycle is basically how active is a column over time. So the red ones are more active than the green ones. The green ones are less active. Um, so as you can see, it's sort of scattered throughout. Um, that means that the activity is being spread throughout the spatial pooler with no topology because every column's potential pool is spread throughout the input space and every column's column neighborhood is the entirety of the spatial pooler. So that allows all the activity to be spread throughout all the columns in the spatial pooler. If we turn topology on and we start again, you're going to see very quickly that the activity is localized in the spatial pooler to match the activity within the input space. And even if we turn this off, you can see this, this, this moving of the bits from one side to the other as the input space changes. That's what we're seeing here. Um, you're saying most of the activity is in this part of the space. And that's very obvious when you have topology on because you can see in the spatial pooler some spatial representation of the input data even if you don't see the input data just by looking at the active duty cycles of the spatial pooler. So you might be able to see now how an applied topology uh, might help localize spatial patterns better express themselves in this n-dimensional space. But the truth is we very rarely use topology in today's HTM systems. So I thought I should talk a bit about why we don't. Um, so from my perspective, the main reason is that the input spaces that we're dealing with in, in our HTM systems are, are usually too small for topology to have a, a general positive effect on the results that we're trying to get. We're usually trying to do anomaly detection on scalar inputs. So the input space is really small. It includes an encoding of a timestamp and maybe one or two scalar values. Um, at, this, uh, at, at this size, the topology doesn't, doesn't give you much. And also, the encoders that we use to encode data do not attempt to encode data topologically at all. So there doesn't seem to be any benefit of turning on topology if the data is not topological.
also topology adds computation costs and it decreases performance, although it might uh, increase learning efficiency. Uh, it, it decreases general performance, uh, takes longer to perform each step. All that being said, there's a reason I made this episode. Topology is really important to HTM theory. Um, as HTM scales and the input space that we're dealing with gets larger and larger, we're going to need to use topology to understand these larger input spaces. And if you're talking about HTM as a model of a small section of cortex, as that section of cortex gets larger and we need to integrate it with other sections of cortex, topology and how it's implemented, again, becomes important on a, on a different type of scale. Uh, so we can't ignore it. We, we have to try and understand how it works. So, hey, thanks for watching this episode on topology. We're going to be moving into uh, temporal memory, sequence, sequence memory algorithms soon. It's either bursting or, or temporal memory, or we, I haven't quite figured out exactly the entry point we're going to make into temporal memory, but the next episode is going to be about sequence memory. And uh, that builds on top of everything we've talked about so far. So I hope you're looking forward to that. It's going to be after the holidays, but uh, I'll see you then. Where am I at? 10 minutes? Oh yeah, totally. I think that was pretty good. Uh... Synced and fantastics. <laughs> fantastics. Now, depending on who you are talking to, topology... Hello, and welcome to H... Hello, and welcome to A... Some neurons in the cortex are closer than others, so a neuron is... Singing it up. Okay. So, in when the columns are uh, compared for who's winning not uh, <clears throat> the input space damn it damn it, damn it. there we go <laughs> so uh the so I, I click on one of these I click on one of these columns, um, so it's the you know the entire column here. Sorry, I'm still <laughs> getting used to these controls. Uh, <clears throat> and and while there may be a, <clears throat> well, I don't know if I want to say that. We're not in a place to do that. Right. Blah. 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 Also. Here's my guitar.